There were giants in the earth in those days, and when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children, the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. The Maya and Incas of South America believed a race of giants existed on Earth before the Great Flood. So did many other ancient civilizations. Some took them for gods, others left likenesses of them in stone or wrote about them in their histories. The Greeks and Romans told of blood falling from heaven and landing in the lap of the Earth goddess Gaia, who gave birth to the Titans a race of fearsome giants. Perhaps the most famous of all was Goliath the Philistine, one of five giant brothers. Vendel Jones is an archaeologist with a style of his own. He spent a lifetime tracking down Goliath and the Ark of the Covenant, with which the Jewish holy book of the Midrash tells us the giant made off. Goliath crashed his way through the Israeli uh, soldiers, ran over and scooped the ark up on his shoulder, slew Pinchas and Hophe, and took the ark back to the camp of the Philistines. It was in this field, 15 miles southwest of present-day Jerusalem, that legend says Goliath was finally slain. Not by a giant warrior like himself, but by a puny boy, David, who, as this 9th century BC tablet indicates, would later become king of the Israelites. The spiral-shaped Gilgal Rephaim is situated in the Golan Heights, 50 miles from Damascus. Constructed from an estimated 40,000 tons of loose rocks, it is remarkably reminiscent of Stonehenge. Both have been dated at around 5,000 years old and have similar megalithic stones. And like Stonehenge, Gilgal is also said to be associated with giants. Only in this case, there's biblical text which seems to support the claim. Israeli archaeologist Daniel Herman is investigating the newly opened grave. This is a tomb of someone obviously a very powerful man. Look at the size of the stone slabs used. This must have taken an enormous amount of time and effort to construct. When the Israelites came here and wrote their Bible, it was already here. They saw it. So they have documented the identification of the site by saying that this region was ruled by Og, king of the Bashan. Og is described in the book of Deuteronomy as, and I quote, <clears throat> For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the Rephaim. Rephaim is Hebrew word for giant. In Lebanon, 44 miles from Beirut, are the imposing ruins of Baalbek. There is mention of this place in the Old Testament's Book of Kings. Baalbek in particular is a very good example. That has the trilophon. Those are the largest stones in the world ever used for construction. They're so large we don't even know their actual weight. Uh, those stones were somehow quarried, moved five miles, lifted 25, 30 feet in the air, and placed together so closely that you can't fit a razor blade or a piece of paper in between them. We have no idea how they did it. We don't have a crane in the world that can lift weights anywhere near what those things are. 
No one knows for sure, but according to Arab tradition, the earliest temples were built here after the great flood by a tribe of giants for the biblical king Nimrod. But what exactly do we mean by the word giant? Bloodthirsty monsters like the one-eyed cyclops of Homer's Odyssey? Or the fee-fi-fo-fum ogres of children's fairy tales? Or could it also include peaceable giants? The Lucy tribe, for instance, are very large. Uh, the median height for most of their males is close to about seven feet. They're extremely tall. There are biblical references to even taller people who lived in ancient times. Rabbi Itzhak Mamostin of the Center of Jewish Studies in Vancouver, Canada. It seems quite clear because of the references in Genesis and later on the book of Numbers and also in, in Deuteronomy, which are all fairly consistent with each other, that there were gigantic beings that seemed to stem from pre-flood era. Is it possible that environmental conditions of past ages favored the development of giants? Certainly we know from fossil evidence that some species, like dinosaurs, grew many times larger than they do today. A supporter of this thought-provoking and controversial theory is Dr. Carl Bohr. Optimal genetic expression means the best that the organism has within the DNA is expressed because of favorable atmospheric conditions. Based on fossil evidence, trees like the California giant sequoia grew much larger than they do today. One theory explains this by proposing that environmental conditions in the distant past were more conducive to gigantic growth. under these described conditions. Plants and animals would live longer, be much larger, and that's precisely what we find in the geologic column, in the fossil record. Plants were much larger, all living systems were larger. We have animals that today have an eight or nine foot stature with a 16 to 20 foot stature. We have insects such as the dragonfly, Today, the dragonfly has perhaps a four-inch wingspan. In the fossil record, his counterpart, Meganeuropsis, had up to a five-foot wingspan. Everything was larger in the past. I'm of the opinion that under better atmospheric conditions, people were living uh, not only longer, but they were taller, much taller. Giants and dinosaurs could not exist today as they did in the past because the atmospheric conditions simply will not permit it. We had a greater ozone layer at the time prior to the flood. At the time of the flood, it was diminished to about one-seventh of what it was at that time, and therefore, life on this earth as we know it no longer has the same life expectancy as it did at the time of the flood. A thinning of the ozone layer means less protection from the ionizing radiation from space and less protection for plants and animals. Being interested in Earth's original conditions, after 35 years of research on those parameters, I've attempted to reconstruct that context. And in so doing, I've had our engineers build a biosphere that doubles the atmospheric pressure that increases the electromagnetic energy, that increases the ratio of oxygen, but not to the level of toxicity, that eliminates ultraviolet radiation, etc. And the experiments that we've run have been very gratifying. In our control scientific experiment, we have measured the effects of a pulsed electromagnetic field on biological systems. We have these Pacu piranha fish that normally at three and a half years of age are about this size under optimal conditions. 
yet we have them now in excess of 20 inches, weighing just under five pounds each under these controlled conditions. We have succeeded in producing giantism at an accelerated rate. Taken at face value, the research looks persuasive, though it has not yet been replicated by other scientists.